All right, guys. Well, hello. My name is Stefan. This is my first time back to the U.S. in three years. And Dr. Khan was nice enough to invite me here today to share how I ended up doing what I am currently doing. So a uh, little bit of background info on me. I uh, graduated uh, in 2019 with a bachelor's in civil engineering. I <clears throat> I uh, graduated with a specialization in transportation engineering, and I was sitting exactly where you guys were uh, seven years ago. But uh, my zip code isn't in Sacramento anymore. My zip code is in the Netherlands now. I live in the Dutch city of Harlem. It's a city of around 150,000 people. And it's around a a uh, 15 minute train ride away from Amsterdam. So this is what the uh, Dutch train station of Harlem looks like. This is what it looks like when you get off of the train from Amsterdam. And I live around a three minute walk away from this train station. So I can just walk here and I can take a train to go anywhere in the country where I want. So because of that, I don't have to own a car like most Dutch people. And like most Dutch people, instead I own three bicycles. I own three bicycles, which is very typical Dutch. So in the U.S., there's a statistic, you know, there's more guns than people in the U.S. In the Netherlands, there are more bicycles than people. So I really did my best to integrate. And the bicycle is a better tool for getting around in a lot of contexts. So, for example, getting around in the downtown, like the, the city center here, where all of your destinations are close together, or uh, to the uh, center square, where they have a big market every Saturday. This is a huge pedestrianized zone where it's completely closed off to car traffic, or just to cycle along the canals that Dutch cities like Harlem are quite well known for. And my day job is working for the uh, city of Harlem. So gemeente, the word you can see up there that's partially blocked, it's uh, the Dutch word for municipality. And my job title is Verkehrs Advisor. And if you were to translate that literally from Dutch, it means traffic advisor. But it's the equivalent more of a city engineer who works on transportation projects. And the work of a Verkehrs Advisor mainly revolves around road reconstructions. So every 20 to 30 years, a, 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 the road, the life cycle of a road is 20 to 30 years. So every year, the city of Harlem is rebuilding a few of them. And of course, there is a civil engineering aspect to that. We have the grading of the road, the thickness of the pavement, the drainage of the road that we have to consider. And there's a lot of other aspects too, like the uh, biodiversity of the space, the ecology of it. How can we preserve the green space when we're doing these kinds of reconstructions? And of course, because it is a road, there is a mobility aspect to it. So every time we rebuild a road, there is an opportunity to improve it. So the city of Harlem has the goal to have 60% of all trips in the, to and from the city to be by pedestrians, uh, cyclists, and transit. So my job as a vicarious advisor is to try to figure out how do we redesign every street and road to make that kind of travel behavior happen. So a, lo a lot of what I do is we convert from car parking to bicycle parking, getting some more room for greenery, uh, giving more rooms for pedestrians and so on. But because I'm American, I like to hold on to my American roots. I like to work more than just, just my day job. So I also like to work on the side. So I think that there's a lot of value in Dutch design philosophy. And I was really interested in me being in my position. I wanted to help break it down for people, for people who watch YouTube videos about, oh, Dutch infrastructure is so great, but how do we actually build that kind of infrastructure in places like the US? So I made a YouTube channel where I really tried to break down the how of it for an engineer who might be interested in emulating some specific infrastructure examples uh, that they see on YouTube videos. And then I also, for volunteer work, I volunteer with a charity that brings uh, pickup trucks and ambulances to the Ukrainian military in Kiev. So a lot, all of my work in uh, one way or another is somehow related to mobility. It's a, it's a recurring theme with me. 
And uh, my work with that group gave me the chance to go to Ukraine last month. So this is a photo of a bridge in Irpin. Irpin, does anyone know where Irpin is? Okay, it's uh, approximately uh, five kilometers north of Kiev. And this is where, when the war started, this is where the Russian advance was stopped, five kilometers from Kiev. And this is one of the bridges that the Ukrainians blew up to stop the Russian military from entering Kiev. And I wanted to share this with you guys today because I think it goes to show how transportation is so much more than just uh, concrete and steel. So this bridge was the evacuation route for many civilians who were trying to flee from all the shelling and bombing that was going on. It was also the first thing that had to be rebuilt when people wanted to move back. So that's what the, the bridge on the left side has been rebuilt, but they decided to leave this as a memorial. So transportation having this aspect, the fact that transportation is what really ties communities together. It's the bedrock of communities. That's really the aspect of it that really motivated me to do this kind of work. And it's also what pushed me to uh, move abroad for it. So let me explain how I actually ended up here because I know that doing this isn't really a typical kind of thing to do. It's not something that Sac State advertises to do, at least last time I checked on the website, Dr. Khan. And no, I get this question a lot. I did not move to the Netherlands for the weed either. <laughs> when I was sitting where you guys are now, I wouldn't have expected myself to do this. But in a way, I was already on the path because I was really hyper-focused on trying to think critically during engineering education instead of just memorizing concepts. And that's because in college, we have the opportunity to really cultivate critical thinking instead of just memorizing concepts. And that's something when, uh, before I transferred to Sac State, I went to Sierra College. And that's something they really hammered on when I went there. And I had a professor there who had a story he really liked to tell about his experience with working with new engineers in the private sector. So this engineer told a story where, this uh, professor told a story where he would uh, see a new engineer and the new engineer would get this assignment to develop a new baby stroller for a new product line. And the engineer would go ahead and they would, they would uh, start to, to design the best baby stroller in existence. They'd use the best materials. They'd use manufacturing techniques that they would see in aircraft manufacturing, the same kind of tolerances you would see for chip manufacturing. And it would be the best baby stroller ever designed. And they would then proudly present their work to the engineering manager. And what do you think guys think the engineering manager said? It was immediately rejected. And that's because the engineer had just designed something that would cost $10,000 to build. So it was a very good baby stroller, but it was also a completely useless baby stroller because nobody in their right mind would pay that much for a baby stroller. So the lesson that the professor really hit on was that an engineer really needs to understand the context of the challenge being presented to them. If you see a problem and you just jump straight you just jump straight into the problem without thinking about it you can come up with a solution but that solution is often going to miss the point entirely so in the case of traffic engineering is your main challenge to move cars or is it to move the people who are in the cars and excuse me that is uh, something that uh, i really had an opportunity to expand on when i went to sac state so I took Dr. Khan for transportation. I was always asking him questions like, well, hold on, if speed equations for speed limits are based on weather conditions, why don't we have variable speed limits to reflect that? Or why do we always assume constant traffic growth even in places where the population is expected to stay exactly the same? Doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Or, and uh, Sac State, I think is also a really great place to support that because Something that really makes Sac State stand out, guys, is that you have a huge number of clubs and extracurriculars that you guys can join. And there's a lot of colleges that just don't have as many that Sac State has. So you have ASCE with the uh, professional tours and all the resume workshops. You have the mid-pack clubs like Wire Treatment and Concrete Canoe, PCI, the Big Bean Competition, EERI, which has to do with earthquake engineering. And you can even do some research with a faculty member if you get lucky. So 
I was one of those lucky ones and I got to do some uh, research with Dr. Khan about studying sound alarms in construction zones. And it was a pretty interesting experience. I learned a lot, uh, but I also got, as a bonus, I got to watch Dr. Khan uh, use traffic cones for four months. Those were just the highlights. There was a lot more. <laughs> and also, in my opinion, these kind of experiences are just as valuable as your time in the classroom because it gives you a sense of what you really enjoy doing and a chance to apply what you've learned in the classroom. So for as an example, I did Concrete Canoe, and I really enjoyed that club. I learned a lot, but I also learned that I would never want to touch concrete as a career. It wasn't that interesting to me. Um, but I enjoyed the transportation challenges a lot more. That's what really started pushing me towards transportation. And I would have never have gotten that knowledge if I had just stuck to the classroom. So everything was going pretty well. I had been uh, spending the last four years really being encouraged how to think creatively, take a step back before trying to solve a problem. But a lot of that kind of changed when I started working in the industry. So for me, I found that how it is in industry is often the exact opposite of how it is in the classroom. So there's a lot of, instead of having to take a step back and think about it, there's a lot of pre-made solutions in the transportation industry. So you have to, if you have congestion on the road, the automatic default is to widen the road. If you have a speeding problem, it's obviously seen as a enforcement issue. So you have to use law enforcement to try to fix the problem. And if there is some design work, it's often based on pre-made templates. So it, for me, it felt like a workflow where a lot of the engineering and the critical thinking was removed from the process. I, at one point, I even had a, a engineer in the industry tell me, you know, uh, treat your design standards like a cookbook, i.e. follow the recipe, don't think too much. And as someone who likes thinking, and it's my last four years really trying to develop that, Dr. Khan can tell you this, I really didn't like that because I went into this field because I wanted to solve problems. I didn't want to be a human calculator and I didn't, and I didn't want to just follow a recipe blindly. I wanted to solve problems. So I sort of went down this rabbit hole where I tried to find solutions on my own for safety problems on roads. So for example, on the top left, that is a photo of a Dutch train. And then on the bottom left, that's a photo of a classical Dutch bicycle. And something they're really good at doing in the Netherlands is combining the two together to replace car trips. But to do that, they need to build large bike parking garages near the train stations to accomplish that. And that's what this photo on the top right is. So this is the, the bike parking garage station at Utrecht uh, train station. And it has enough uh, bike parking spaces for 13,000 bicycles. So in Utrecht, many people don't drive anymore because they can just cycle to this train station, park their bike, take a train, and then they can go anywhere in the country that they want to. Or as another example, reinventing classical infrastructure we're already familiar with. So this is what the Dutch call a turbo roundabout. And it was a concept developed in the Netherlands. And it was a... Uh, it's estimated it's proven to be 50% safer than your classical two-lane roundabout because they get rid of the weed conflict here. So after doing this for around a year of just uh, learning remotely during COVID, I decided that I wanted to take it to the next step and I wanted to try to learn this more in person and I wanted to learn from the Dutch directly. So during COVID, because everybody was working from home, I also did that, but I took the extra step of moving my home to the Netherlands to try to uh, work with the Dutch directly. And I've been there ever since. So maybe as a uh, more concrete example of what I'm talking about, how would the Dutch try to tackle the problem of congestion that we're very familiar here with in the US? So this is the road of Europa Weg, and it is a uh, two-lane road that runs north to south in Harlem. And we had some big problems with this road in Harlem. We had a lot of uh, traffic congestion. 
that was happening at this intersection here, for example. And we also had a lot of near misses and crashes. And so the city decided that they were going to do something about the, the traffic congestion problem in, in the, this area. Does anybody want to take a guess on what we decided to do to solve this problem? Yes. Roundabout, that's a good, that's a good uh, point. Anything else? Yes. Yeah, you, you nailed it. That is exactly what we did. You were also right. So we, we, instead of widening the road, we actually shrunk it to one lane in each direction. And then we also replaced this big intersection with this single lane roundabout. And as a result of those changes, traffic congestion went down on the road. And that probably sounds counterintuitive for a lot of people, right? Because you have this fixed capacity, you would think if you take away lanes, traffic somehow would increase, but it didn't happen. And so this is where we need to take a step back for a second to understand what's going on here. So a road that is 30 miles per hour theoretically has a free flow capacity of 1400 vehicles per hour. And that's assuming that cars are maintaining a two second following distance so people are actually driving safely. However, we don't have free flow conditions in cities. We have all kinds of things that are mucking it up. We have crosswalks, stop signs, pesky pedestrians, and we also have traffic signals. So it's not free flow conditions. We have stop and go conditions in cities. So for instance, if we're looking at a simple model of an intersection and we were to study this lane right here that's entering the intersection, the, the signal is not going to be green the entire time, obviously. In the best case scenario, it might be green 50% of the time. So this lane doesn't have a capacity of 1,400 vehicles per hour. It's gonna have a capacity of maybe 700 vehicles per hour. But it gets even worse because while this traffic signal is red, we're gonna have a queue that forms that needs to be cleared. So instead of being 700 vehicles per hour, we're probably gonna be closer to 500 vehicles per hour. So the really important point here, guys, is that it's not the road that's the bottleneck, it's the intersection. And it doesn't matter how much you widen the road in front of the intersection, this is the bottleneck and this is what's always gonna be slowing you down. So in the case of Europa Bay, we have uh, two lanes, two through lanes that were approaching the intersection. So we could say, okay, we have a 500 vehicles per hour capacity here, 500 vehicle capacity there. So combined together, it's a thousand vehicles per hour. But that's still less than the free flow capacity of a single lane, which is 1400 vehicles per hour. So even if we have a single lane and then we widen it to two through lanes, we're still not meeting the full capacity of a free flow lane. So it turns out that the second lane we had ended up being completely useless. It wasn't adding anything in terms of operation. It was just making the road more dangerous because it was allowing people to weave back and forth across the travel lanes and causing all kinds of unsafe traffic behavior. So when it came time to rebuild the road, we just decided we're not gonna spend the money to put the second lane back there. And instead, we use that money to uh, convert that giant intersection into a roundabout, which would give us better traffic flow. And in addition to better traffic flow, it's also much better for the context of the area. So this roundabout is much easier for cyclists and pedestrians to cross. And that's really important if a city like Harlem is trying to encourage people to cycle or walk more. So if we can make it easier for them to get around and we can reduce the number of obstacles, this is highly preferred. Or we also replace all of that pavement with extra greenery. So then we have fewer problems with stormwater uh, pollution and uh, drainage. So this is great for the city's drainage system. And it's also better for the taxpayer too, because now instead of having to pay for two lanes in each direction, we only have to pay for one lane in each direction. So the point here I'm trying to make guys is that instead of just like reacting to this traffic problem and just widening the road immediately, 
as engineers, we really had to take a step back and think, you know, how the first question we had to ask is, are we in an urban environment or are we in a rural environment? And how do those two kinds of road categories, how are they different from one another? But then also, how can we take the needs of the city, like wanting to encourage more walking and cycling into account? And also, how can we save money in the future as a city? So I like to take credit for that project, but unfortunately it was finished before my time. So yeah, I could, I could have my credit for it, but uh, I know I actually brought a, a project example for you guys that I'm involved in right now. So it's being designed right now. So the street is called Lodovike Fondesalon. It's really a tongue twister. And so this is what the street Lodovike Fondesalon looks like. It's a really worn, old, it's a really worn out old street made out of pavers. And it's around 30 years old and it needs to be replaced. But because we have the goal of boosting bike pedature up 60%, we're not going to just rebuild it exactly as it was. We need to think about, okay, how can we make cycling here easy? How can we make walking here easily? How can we make walking here easier? And so this is a bird's eye view of the street. So you have Lodovic Fondesalon right here. It's, it's paralleling the main regional road which runs here. And then it's uh, to the left is we have this residential neighborhood right here. So this street is providing access to this entire residential neighborhood. And so what that means is that because we're in a neighborhood, we want to have low traffic speeds and we want to have low traffic volumes. So it's compatible with the land use, the land that it's surrounded by. But we also have another uh, opportunity here because we have a bike path that is I really wish I could move that window. There's a bike path that is connecting at the north. Hmm? Ah. Okay, there we go. Thank you. So we have this bike path that's directly connecting to the street from the north. And we also have a bike path that is directly connecting to the south. And so something that the mobility team for the city is tasked with is that we want to improve this street so the street feels like a natural connection of those two bicycle paths. And that's so uh, somebody who lives in the north of Harlem, in the suburbs, can then uh, cycle really easily to the center of Harlem, to the train station. So this is the route they would be using. So somebody who wants to go halfway across the country could cycle from their house to the train station, the park there, go wherever they want, or, you know, maybe they're just going out on a Friday night to have fun. Why they're going isn't that important, but the, the more important thing is that cycling has become much easier and driving and touching your car isn't necessary. You still can, but it's no longer, you're not obligated to do it. So before we, in the Netherlands, before we would just go straight into trying to redesign the street and thinking about things like pavement widths and things like that, the more important thing we have to figure out first is what to do with the current car traffic. Because the car traffic is what makes cycling on the street dangerous, right? Because the car, cars and uh, bike collisions are the leading cause of death. It's like 90% of all cycling fatalities is with other cars. So we need to figure out a way to reduce the amount of car traffic on here, but also to keep the uh, street accessible for anybody who's just trying to drive to their house if we want to have that quality cycling connection. So to do that, we had to mess with the uh, traffic routing a bit. So we turned Lodewijk van Deselen from a two-way street to a one-way street. So you won't be able to drive north anymore. You have to, you can only drive south. And then we had to uh, readjust the orientation of some of the side streets to have a logical traffic flow. And so if we succeed in doing that, a lot of the um, traffic in the area would be diverted to the street on the left here, right here. So the people who are driving into the neighborhood would be using this street more instead of this street. So for instance, if somebody who's coming up this regional highway lives say over here, you know, instead of driving up here like they used to, they would instead use this alternate route to then get to their house. So we're still keeping it open for cars, but we're really trying to shoo car traffic away as much as we can to keep it as safe as possible for cyclists. And then to then reinforce that 
low traffic concept. This is a schematic view. So it hasn't been built yet. It's still in the design phase. This is just a schematic sketch. So to reinforce that, we also changed the right of way a little bit. So where the side street connects with the cycling street that we're building, we put in what we call continuous sidewalks. So a car who might be driving in from a side street needs to drive over the sidewalk. So it's a bit like a speed bump. And then they have to yield to any uh, bicyclist or car who's already on the street. And then they can merge in. So because the cyclist doesn't have to stop, the street then feels like a logical connection between those two bike paths. And then we have a, uh, and then we can start talking about the actual local design. So the width is four and a half meters in freedom units, that's 14 and a half feet. And then we also have a, a seven and a half foot sidewalk on the housing side and a four foot sidewalk on the other side. And then we just have a standard gutter widths. And then to top it off, we use red asphalt instead of normal asphalt because the bike paths that are leading to this street are also red. So this street now looks exactly like the bike paths that the cyclists were using. So this becomes a very intuitive connection for people to use. And also is great because car drivers are more aware that they're on a cycling street now instead of just a regular uh, car street that they used to be on. And then I also took some uh, screenshots of the engineering plans. So this is what the future design will look like. So the, the cycle path that's connected from the north is up here. And we entirely avoid this intersection here. And we instead bend around here. So we're avoiding all these dangerous high-speed conflict points. And we come into the street like this. So it's still separated. And then we cross one of the side streets. So because this is a cycling route, we want to give cyclists priority. So we have these yield markers here that tell cars, OK, you have to yield to the cyclists. We also have a uh, speed plateau here. So a car has to drive up a little bit and reduce their speed so we can very safely manage the, the uh, danger of that conflict zone there. And then it will actually enter the street itself where there's some mixing going on. And then this is what the street will look like itself. So just to explain some of the hatching. So this is the uh, red asphalt. This pattern here, uh, represents where the parallel parking will go. So we still have car parking on the street. This is for the sidewalk, and this is these continuous sidewalk things I was telling you about. And then also because there's more than just mobility, we're also um, adding things like green space to the project. And then this is uh, where the uh, cycle street then connects to the southern route. So we are crossing two streets. Again, we have a speed hump, a speed plateau for both, and then it connects to the cycle path on the south. And then this is what the, uh, the typical cross section of it looks like. So we have a two way for cyclists, a one way for cars, parallel parking, and then um, pedestrians on either side. I wasn't able to translate everything at the head of time, unfortunately. And then, uh, that's mostly it, guys. I also wanted to give a little bit of insight for anyone who's also interested in working abroad. So the good news is that most countries like the Netherlands, um, they don't have a PE system. They don't have a license. You don't need some kind of special certification to work there. It's treated a lot like mechanical engineering or like aerospace engineering. You just get your college degree, you get some work experience, and you kind of stand on your own two feet on your previous project experience. The main the main um, barrier is the language. And you can uh, start working for a, an international company where that's English is spoken more often. And so most Americans who live in the Netherlands, they start by working for a large international company. And then as their language skills improve, they might make a hop to a more local firm or for working for a city like Harlem. And that's all I had for you guys today. I wanted to open up to questions if you guys had any questions. I know Dr. Johnson probably has a bunch. Uh, yes. Why? How is it the way it is? Yeah. So there's a lot. There's a lot of. It's a great question. So a lot of people think that the Netherlands is the way it is just because it's European, right? And it's flat, and people have always done that. But 
So way back in the 60s, they were doing the same things we were. So they were building freeways straight through cities. They had a horrible traffic death rate. So they were losing 3,000 people every year. And that's in a country of 16 million people. So that would be like, if you adjusted it for population, that'd be like 90,000 Americans getting killed every year on roads. So the Dutch have a pretty open political system. And the Dutch also love being very direct. So there was a political movement that started called Stop the Kindermort. That means stop murdering kids. It's a pretty simple, straightforward message. And then, so that that was the political uh, side of it. But then I think also one of the, there, there's kind of pros, there's, uh, there's benefits and drawbacks, but one of the benefits of not having engineer as a protected word is that a lot of times people who are in positions of power who do the technical design tend to be a little more open-minded because there's not a piece of paper saying that they know better than everybody else. So, and also in the Netherlands, uh, they have this one called polder politique, where it's uh, everybody kind of gets to have their say on a topic before it gets decided on. So when uh, they wanted to build a freeway through Amsterdam, a lot of people said, we really don't want that. And, and they ended up having to vote on it and it ended up getting defeated by three votes. So it's kind of, I think, a combination of all those different things. Yes. Okay, so let's go up to here. So you're asking why doesn't, um, so if we have the cycle street here and then this is the road, why doesn't somebody just keep going this way? Oh, like why don't they drive the wrong way? Sure, sure. So, I mean, so the actual bike path part, so the part that's not the cycle street, that's only three meters wide. So that's basically almost too narrow for a car at that point. And they also have bollards there that will, stop a car from driving through unless they ram it on purpose or something. Uh, for the cycle street itself, so for to avoid going the wrong way, yeah, I, I wish I had a better answer for you. So that's actually something that's being kind of discussed right now with the city is that, you know, how do we stop people from, for example, driving this way and then going this way? And so we're, we're trying, we're discussing right now is we're trying to figure out if we can create maybe a shortcut through one of the side streets here. Um, but I guess the, the short answer is that we just try to make doing the right thing as convenient as possible. And then if somebody does do the wrong thing, that cycle street is still four and a half meters wide. So it's still wide enough where a car can drive the wrong way and then a cyclist can still ride side by side with another one. So that's kind of the forgiving aspect of the design. So even if somebody's being stupid, it's not gonna result in a trip to the morgue. So, yeah, yes. We actually do. Yeah. So it's, um, that's the thing is the Netherlands is in a perfect country. So the kind of ridiculous thing is that the, uh, somebody can, uh, who has a company in the Netherlands or sole proprietorship can import a pickup truck for the United States, one of the big ramp trucks. And because it's a business expense, then they can get a tax deduction on it and then drive around with it and then, you know, rent it off on their taxes. So unfortunately, because of that kind of legal gimmick we have, you're actually seeing more and more pickup trucks to uh, another ones, but that's sort of also, um, it's a little funny. That's also where the charity I work with, they try to um, buy as many of those pickup trucks as they can and send them to Ukraine where they actually belong. So, yeah, I wish that, I, I wish it wasn't that way, but unfortunately it is, yes. Last mile shipping? Yes. Yes. Well, so in cities like Harlem, the city tries to encourage uh, deliveries to be made as much as possible by very small vehicles like bicycles or the very small electric trucks. But the cars are still open for car traffic. The, the cities are still open for car traffic. So it's that that's the difference between an access and a through function. So we don't have these big roads that are blasting through the city. We just make it inconvenient to drive through the city. So you can still drive with your lorry or your truck into the city and, and do uh, the drop off. So Harlem, maybe I can... Uh, find where I can go further back. So this entire, so this uh, center part of the city right here, for example. So this part right here is more or less uh, legally classified as a pedestrian zone. So pedestrians always have the right of way. But one thing you can do with the Netherlands is that you can almost park anywhere you want with the uh, loading or unloading vehicle because it's very safe just to walk around the pickup truck. So. In a lot, a lot of ways, it's better because when you have a logistics vehicle, you don't have to worry about all these other cars coming in and then blocking you. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. It depends on the size of the project, you know. So if it's uh, something that is just within the city's purview, so if it's just within the municipal borders, I would say you're talking about maybe four years or so from because first we we have this master um, maintenance schedule where we know this street is being rebuilt in two years, this street is being rebuilt in six years, and then the city council has to approve every design because the city council says we want 60% bike pet. So they want to see that every project is accomplishing that. So because the city council likes being involved so much in Harlem, that's something that slows it down a bit, but it also makes us very consistent. So the last 20 years, we've been rebuilding every street in the city. So we're kind of like a turtle, like we're, we're slow, but we're very consistent. And so in like 20 years or so, it'll be probably be way better than it is now. Yeah. But if you want to rebuild a train station, yeah, good luck. That's going to take 10 or 15 years probably. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Johnson. Yes. Absolutely. So that's, again, it, it always comes down to, in the Netherlands, are we designing for flow or are we designing for access? So if we're designing for flow, we expect to see high car speeds, efficient car movements, and we need separation because if a car is driving 30 miles per hour, that's, if you get hit by a car, that's like almost 50% chance of death. Um, and then also it's just not intuitive if you're driving quickly in a car to come to sudden stops for cyclists or pedestrians. But if you're on a street, which is where all the car parking is, where all the access is, where people are playing in the street. So one of the most common questions that gives, you know, why don't we have cycling lanes on streets in the Netherlands, like you're asking? And that's because we don't want to give 90% of the width to cars. Because once you put in that cycle lane, you're saying that okay, cyclists have to cycle here, then 90% of it's for cars. But we make these access streets really safe with uh, the traffic diversion. We make it inconvenient for the through traffic to go through. So the only people driving here are people who live in this neighborhood. And this it, it's designed in a way where driving more than 20 miles per hour is very um, stressful and it's not pleasant to drive on. So in a way, these kind of streets are almost seen more as driveways. Like it's, if it's meant for access and it's uh, cars are more expected to behave like guests on it. That's one reason why we don't use things like black asphalt. We use either red asphalt for the cycle path or we use the pavers because it, uh, the pavers add an aesthetic quality to the street. And they've actually done studies on this and they found that even if the pavers don't make the rumbling sound, just by making it beautiful, that kind of sends the message that it's not just meant for cars. It's meant it's, it's a place to be. And so people adjust their behavior accordingly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it, it, it's very similar. So you still have to uh, go through a long process. And the more, I, I would say, um, but what actually even stops us from getting there, is, I mean, I mean things like we're very rarely widening things in Harlem. We're actually shrinking things down a lot. Um, the, the, the city council actually made a political decision that we're not investing any money into building new car infrastructure. So we're almost always shrinking instead of widening. But also in Harlem, this is an interesting part about my job. I didn't think this would happen. Um, there's a, the Dutch thing is uh, groen is heilig. It means green is holy, nature is holy. So it's really a fight if you ever want to uh, widen something a little bit, if you want to take away just a little bit of green space. And there's a huge amount of controversy. Like every neighbor is up in arms about it. Like if you want to have a project, we need to cut down some trees. It's just, yeah, God help you because it's not going to go well for you. Like I've, I've discovered that multiple times, so. Yeah, it's, it's more about like, a, it's an interesting dynamic where, you know, you think, okay, cycling is good for the environment, right? But then you want to build a cycle street that you're coming uh, up against, um, 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 what, what's the word I'm looking for? Environmentalists. And it's not, it's not um, a struggle I was kind of expecting to see when I moved over there. Yeah. Yes. To prove a point. No, I'm just um, so I have my regular bike for commuting, just regular everyday commuting. I have an extra bike. So if um, I have a guest, then uh, they can just cycle on that bicycle. And then I have uh, what the Dutch call a buck feet. It's a cargo bike. So it's kind of like the Dutch version of a pickup truck. So it's a big uh, bed in the front. And then so if you ever want to go to the city dump or something or you want to buy a lot of groceries, 
just dump everything you need in there and then you just go on your way. Yeah, a lot of second hand. I have a German friend who actually does that, but it, um, that's not really necessary because let me uh, let me go back to the slide with the trains. Yeah. So, so we have uh, at the uh, so at the uh, train station you have the big bike parking garages, but then when you arrive at your destination, so. Instead of having like a lot of the scooter share companies that we have, the the uh, the, the the company that runs the train system, the NS, they also um, rent out bicycles. So and it, it's a very ingenious model because you use your car, you get a single. Actually, I think I have it. Oh, I don't have my wallet with me right now. They have a single plastic card. You tap in, and you get charged by distance you travel, and then you tap out. But you can also rent a bicycle with that card. So when you exit the train station, you go to the bike parking garage, you rent the bicycle, and it's just a simple like a uh, reverse pedal brake bicycle. And then you can just take that to go to your destination. And because the, the, the business model is that the train company doesn't care about making money on those bicycles because it costs three euros for the whole day to use. But what's more profitable for them is that by having those bicycles at the train station, they're a tr the, the the radius of people who can use a train station now is like triple. So the the business case for is actually they're just bringing in more people to pay for train tickets that way. And the bicycle is kind of this very subsidized way to make it happen. Whereas if you have the scooter share model, it ends up being a lot more expensive. And that's one reason why you don't see a lot of uh, shared scooter services in the Netherlands. It's very hard to compete with the train company. Um, so you, if, you, if you want to have a scooter, electric scooter, you have to have a license plate for it because the, I think the rule is with the exception of e-bikes, which doesn't quite make sense. If your vehicle has a motor, it must have a license plate on it. So that's, but they, some of the scooter share companies do do that, but it's just that a lot of people then just buy their own. So some people buy electric scooters, but I haven't seen too many bands of them. Yes. <laughs> oh yeah, I, I forgot to plug it in. It's called Build the Lanes. Uh, let's show you what it looks like. Oh, there we go. Build the Lanes. That's the plug. Everybody subscribe to Build the Lanes. <laughs>